You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network. <laughs> Oh yes, most definitely, one has. Well, it'd be a very dull world otherwise, wouldn't it? Created by Iron Allen and Mark Johnson. Twin Souls is hosted by myself, Philip, along with my twin brother, Ronald Kinsella, in association with the Paranormal UK Radio Network. A warm welcome to all our listeners. Now, it's again my esteemed pleasure to introduce Terry Lovelace, who is here for the second part of his programme. And he's the author of the best selling book, Incident at Devil's Den, on Amazon. And Terry is a former assistant attorney general and had the most amazing experience and proof to share of his lifelong interaction with UFOs and seemingly intrusive abduction by non-terrestrial beings. Not only has he suffered along with his family in silence until recently, but he was also targeted by the Office of Special Investigations in order to silence him. Hello, Terry. Yes. Yes. Good to, good to talk to you, Philip. We're now, really good to be here. Great, and, and, and Ronnie's with us as well too. Hello, Ronnie. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, Terry, we got to the um, part where you had been investigated by the OSI and uh, they had given you some type of drug to try and, uh, you know, make you force the truth out of you. And, uh, and, and we got to that part. So do you want to carry on f- uh, for our listeners to, with your amazing story of UFOs and uh, alien interaction? Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm not sure if we reached the conclusion of that interrogation or not. So I, I will wrap that up. Uh, yeah, sure. Briefly. Um, but they, I was administered a drug and I was uh, uh, placed under hypnosis. I did yeah. everything, everything possible uh, to resist the hypnosis. And, and I think we've covered that. Yeah. And the bottom line was that after this four hours of interrogation, uh, they went through the reverse process to bring me out of the hypnotic state, which uh, I believe I never entered. Mm -hmm. Uh, As I said last time, I resisted uh, every hypnotic suggestion, every every instruction they gave me, I would do the opposite. Uh, So the, the drug I had no control over, and there are things that I can't, times I can't account for, but uh, what had happened was it drug, it dragged, pardon me, all of this, all of this, uh, these memories yes. that I had, that had been underneath, everything was brought to the surface. Uh, and there are things that I remember and know today that I would not remember but for that interrogation. So uh, in a way, I'm glad to know, I, I fought hard to hold on to those memories uh, even the bad ones, because at the time I felt like I own these images. They, they, they are part of my mind. They are, you know, they're, they're mine. And I did not want to let them take them away from me, even, even the ugly ones. Uh, hmm. So I, I fought hard to keep those. And at the end of our hypnotic session, um, the um, hypnotist I refer to as Brad, a major brownfield, asked me, uh, have you said anything or done anything to deceive us? You know, you must answer truthfully. Have you hidden anything from us? And I knew that I had. And I knew that I had not always had control over what came out of my mouth. (laughs) Uh, But I affirmatively said, no, I've I've told the agents everything I have, uh, everything that I know. And, And with that, the OSI agent in charge, Major Gregory, said, well, we will close your file. Uh, and they were there. Evidently, the OSI was satisfied that 
I didn't have any film hidden, which I think was their primary concern. Yes. And I believe that they were under the impression that they wiped away these memories. Um, but in fact, they hadn't. What they'd done is they, they brought them all forward for me to live with. So mm. that was the end of my military service. Uh, not, not because of, of, of that event, but because my enlistment came to an end. It was, this happened in 1977, a short year and a half later, my uh, enlistment was up and I separated from the military. And when I got out, um, I began to run to try to keep in shape and keep my weight down. And it started off kind of as a, as a hobby and became uh, something that, that I did for pleasure. I got hooked on the endorphins. And yeah. I was a, I was a um, pretty consistent runner. I, I mean, I didn't run marathons, but uh, I would run three or four miles a day, but every day. And it, every, day, every time I ran, at the point where I would hit the two-mile mark, give or take 100 yards either way, there was a spot on my right leg just above my knee and to the right that would go absolutely numb. Hmm. And I could, it had clearly defined edges, and I could take a pin and stick it into the uh, numb area and define where the edge started and where it began. And it was circular. Um, wow. And I asked my doctor, my, doc my doctor said, if it doesn't hurt your running, if it doesn't cause you pain, I wouldn't worry about it. And I, and I never did. Mm -hmm. So I, I never gave it a concern. Um, and then 2012, 40 some years later, um, I take a fall and think I may have broken my leg. So my wife takes me to the Veterans Administration emergency room uh, for an x-ray and the x-ray technician uh, came out and said, uh, Mr. Lovelace, have you ever had, suffered a shrapnel wound or, or anything of that sort? And I said, no, I, I never left the, the States. And she asked me, oh, have you been in an automobile accident or some kind of mishap that could account for you having this piece of metal in your leg? And I said, ma'am, I didn't know I had a piece of metal in my leg. Mm. So they took a total of eight shots. Um, and she said, I'm going to ask the radiologist to come down and take a look at this. And a radiologist came down and popped the uh, film up on, on one of the view boards, view screens, took a look at it, walked over and took his finger and poked it into my thigh and said, it will be right here. And I said, what will be right there, doctor? And he says, you have a scar right here where this article entered, where this object entered your body. And I assured him, doctor, I don't have a scar there. And he was insistent that I would have. And he ended up, I took my pants off and he examined my leg and he was, he was perplexed. And he, he had an intern with him and he, he sent the intern to, uh, to get a little handheld black light he said that scar tissue will fluoresce under a black light. Yeah, sure. And he killed the overhead lights and searched every inch of my knee, scrutinized every inch of it, and then had his, his intern do the same. And he could find no scar be, because there is no scar. Hmm. And I asked him, I said, doctor, how many times do you see uh, a foreign object like this in the leg without there being a corresponding scar? And he told me never. He said, in, in 23 years of radiology, I, I've never seen it happen before. Wow. And then there was a, a second film that he popped up. And, and I believe that you have a copy of that film. And it's the film where my leg is bent. And you can see the calf muscle of my leg. Yes, yes, I've seen that. And in that, if you, on that film... From the side, there is a flower petal arrangement. Yes, I've seen those. Interesting. Looks like round objects. Those are actually uh, uh, thin, thin discs. Thin. And they're nearly invisible from the head-on shot because they are so thin. But he has no idea. He, he could not tell me what those are. He had no idea what those could be. Again, there's no uh, uh, place for them to enter the body. There's no scar. He said that the tissue itself was consistent with bone, bone tissue, 
uh, mm-hmm. assured me that bone just doesn't spontaneously sprout in the middle of a of a muscle. Uh, so he found that to be perplexing. I found all of it to be haunting, and I I mm-hmm. did not make the connection until my wife and I were on the ride home, and I, I think we both both must have had this thought at the same time that this numb spot that I've suffered was directly over where that foreign object was found. I did my best to put that out of my mind. I, I, I did. I was not ready to confront that and, and deal with that. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Interesting thing. Um, the VA has a system, and I, and I didn't realize, the Veterans Administration is a entity of the United States government. And I can't complain about the care that I receive, but there were some odd things that happened in that I went online because this this radiologist words just were unsettling, unnerving. Yes. And I went online and I could pull up his report. And I pulled up his report. I I fell on October twenty third, and his report was dated two days later. And that's not unusual. And his report dated October twenty fifth mm-hmm. mentioned an anomalous object. Uh, above the knee and made no mention of the objects below the knee and I thought that's uh, that's odd and I, I told to my wife just a couple of days later I, I told my wife I said I want to I want to show you this let's read this again and I pulled it up and there was another radiology report now, the original radiology report from the radiologist that that examined me that report was gone and in a second oh. report was in its place. Oh, a switch what bit. I, they, they, absolutely. And yeah. what I found, uh, uh, there was nothing to indicate that the second report was an amended or a supplemental report. So a reader would have no knowledge that a previous report ever existed. Oh, and this, this report, dated November 7th, made no, no mention whatsoever. Uh, of the objects either above or below my knee. It simply gave a diagnosis of a baker's cyst. No mention of foreign objects whatsoever, which I thought was um, deceptive. And they took, I think I mentioned the radiologist, uh, the, the technician took a total of eight films. And if you note in the one film, from the head on shot, there are what appear to be two tiny wires that go straight from the leg. Now, I know that they took shots of my leg at the knee and then further up my thigh Mm -hmm. for a total of eight shots. I requested uh, copies of my uh, other films uh, and and I was stonewalled pretty pretty hard on getting copies of these. It, it, It took some persistence. I was finally able to get two shots only and the other six shots um, they said were discarded because of poor quality right. I'm not sure I buy that <laughs> I'm not sure I buy that. oh god <laughs> that's terrible isn't it those are the films that would have shown the, where the wires led to how yes. far up my leg they went yeah that would have been very interesting to see we have seen the photographs in your book as well of the anomalies they're quite un, very unusual extremely unusual they are and i i might mention they with the exception of the numb spot they've never caused me any pain or discomfort and i had a hard time i had a very difficult time dealing with this uh and i i i knew that this was in some way connected to my 1977 abduction from Devil's Den. Yes. And I was going I was going to ask were you was there any way that you knew or the suspicion within your mind that this is what they would call an implant? Yes, the connection with the the aliens that yes. you saw. Yes. Yes. I, I was in complete denial. I and, and I I I would not even entertain that. Um, yeah. For I'm, several months and then something changed. And what changed was uh, the nightmares returned. Oh, God. And for a period of time, after that 1977 abduction, I would have the most horrendous nightmares where I would I would literally wake up screaming and my poor wife would have to calm me down. Yeah. But 
the interesting thing was back in 1977 and 78, when I was going through this, uh, the physical trauma and the mental trauma from the abduction, uh, my wife had suggested that I journal these dreams as a way of coping with them. Yes. And with pen and paper by my bedside, when I would wake up screaming, she would calm me down, put a pen and a paper pad in front of me and say, just write about it. Just write about it. Oh, and I geez. and I did. And it, it was marvelous because it was my way to cope with the nightmares. Uh, and it created a record. And they weren't they weren't on a linear, they weren't chronologically in order, but they are snippets and pieces of the abduction experience. Yes. Uh, when the nightmares reappeared in mid-2013, uh, and they roared back with a vengeance, um, I made the connection, this is all familiar. This is These are the same dreams. This is Can the same thing I dream. Can you can you tell us, Terry, what some a part of what that dream was, if it's okay to say um, over the air? What do you remember? One of them in particular, one of the scenes that 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 haunted you or that made you scream. I mean, that that's so unnerving. It it makes my skin crawl. I, I can give a couple, and I have a couple. What one of the most uh, actually one of the most one of the worst didn't occur from devil's den it occurred when i was eight years old and when i was eight years old i used to have these entities enter my room in the guise of monkeys they look like two yeah. foot circus monkeys and in my dream in the nightmare uh they would hold out the one closest to me the one i think i used to go with would hold out a paw and say, won't you come with us, Terry? Come with us and play, and we'll take you back when we're done. We'll have fun. And in the nightmare, when I when I look down, instead of the paw, there are four long fingers. Oh, God. And, and I look up, and the mask is gone, and yeah. it's the gray alien there. Yes, yes. I was going to say it was them. Um... I... I to this day, I still had that dream on occasion, and I wake up absolutely beside myself, screaming. Jeez. The abduction dreams are are terrifying in that they they start so benign. They start with uh, sitting around the campfire with with Toby, and you know we're we're just laughing and, and enjoying the allure of camping we'd never been before and having a good time and then the dream will turn dark and Toby will point out the lights just like he did he said hey were those there before and he drew my attention to the lights and in my dream we watched the lights grow and then reappear again as this enormous triangle over our heads and yeah. part of that was I pulled back the flap of the tent and in the field were ahead of us where we parked, I call it a meadow, were what I thought were first little kids, 15 or so, what I thought were, were children. Yeah. And I asked Toby, I said, Toby, what, what are these kids doing out here? And he said, man, those ain't no little kids. And I looked at them, and I, and I can remember in such detail, and, and this comes roaring back in the dream when it, because it hits home that these aren't children, it hits home then that these aren't even human beings. Because I, I, I can tell from the the size of the head is disproportionate to the body and the limbs and the gait. Um, they did not walk like um, like little children would walk, or even a human would walk. And at, when I when I saw them and I made that realization that they weren't human. That's a major component of the nightmare that comes back roaring. That and in when we were inside, they took us inside this enormous triangle, and we were standing, uh, and there were other people in there. And that haunts my thoughts and dreams, is whatever happened to those other people? Mm, yes. And there was, I, I, I'm sure glad that... that we made it out alive. I feel happy to have made it out of there alive. But the screams, I recall Toby screaming, and that'll, that'll be a nightmare 
a lot of times. And I recall a woman's scream. It's just really honking. Yes. And, and that, that when I hear her screams, that wakes me up every time. It's very, very disturbing. Right. I mean, uh, normally, normally through an abduction or these abduction cases, time and time again, Terry, the, this same occurrence of the Oz factor, Jenny Randall's here in England created that term. She's a British ufologist. This Oz factor of, uh, of strangeness, high strangeness, seems to encompass uh, the individual or individuals when this is taking place, almost to the point of corruption with the mental processing or our normal mental processing. So... Um, I know that you were taking on board the craft and of course the OSI were obviously intent in believing that you'd taken some films of this triangular craft at Devil's Den. Um, but I, I really feel for you, Terry. I mean, my, bro my brother and I both do with what you've gone through because yes. I mean, we, yes. we've, got, we've, we've both gone through a, uh, different situations, but uh, one of which was very horrifying. So yeah. I, I can uh, empathize on that. But the the uh, the greys evidently took you away and implanted these things in you. These tracking devices, I, I assume they are. So, do you have any memories or flashbacks of them, Terry? Of the greys actually implanting these in you, or or not? Not, not one. Never. I, I wish I had. I, I wish I could. Yeah. And, and it see, I search my mind looking for that, uh, and I'm surprised that in all the nightmares that I've had, I've never had any recall. Um, what, whatever memory was there, they successfully erased that memory because uh, it's it's never recurred. So I wish I knew. I I don't know how these things got in my leg. Yeah. Um, Terry, can I also ask when when the reoccurring nightmares um, s surface and you were in the ship with your bud and you see this woman screaming? Is it light in the ship or is it darkish? Do you have any um, feeling of your environment or is it? Are you just focused on the woman? No, I, I, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm looking around, and I'm noticing things, yeah. and it's well lit. On the, the, the inside of the thing was very well lit, and everything was chrome and white. Pardon me, chrome. I mean stainless steel. I misspoke. And white almost like a porcelain. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, windows, like enormous windows. And the inside of the craft, I recall, there were three flying saucers parked below deck like like on below deck like airplanes on, a, on an aircraft carrier yes yeah uh, lined up in a neat little row uh, setting off to the left that caught my attention and i remember that when and you were I, a child that's right you saw one of them yes and they were the same they were the, could have been that's the same right. ones I, I don't know that's right I, I reckon they are i think you were it sounds to me as you said yourself uh, methodically a pattern is forming and it does when as our uh, uh, ufologist here david ike uh, suggests when you connect the dots which you're doing it would seem that these are part of your past as well very interesting you know there is um and, and i hope i'm not repeating myself um uh, but inside no, the, no, 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 you're fine, you're there, fine. There was, inside the craft, there was uh, an experience that, that haunts me and is is also a part of my nightmares. And, uh, you know, th those journals really serve two purposes. They, they help me to cope with the nightmares. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they preserved a very good record of, uh, of what happened to me and events that I would have forgotten but for them. Yes. Now, Terry, I want to ask also that with regards to your um, apparent implants, and I, I, I'm, I've looked at the x-rays that you've sent, and they're the most bizarre things I've ever seen in my life. In fact, when I saw them, I, I shuddered. Now, I, I understand through your book also that there was uh, that you were wanting to get this story out or you were coaxed into getting the story out and that there was another encounter with, a, with another being that, that had a warning for you. Was that correct, Terry, if I rem remember correct? Because I've read your book twice. Was it was yes. to, yeah. Can you explain about yes. that, Terry? Yes. In 2013, I, I was dealing with coping with this and living with this, and I still had no intention of writing a book. In 2014, um, I felt anger. And then, Philip, this may sound odd, but I felt betrayed. Yes. That is that for 40 years, I kept their secret. Yes. I felt like I kept my part of the bargain, you know? Hmm. I've never said a word. I've kept your secret. Now i got to deal with these nightmares again. It's not fair. You know, I felt uh, sure. 
and at that point, that that was I can remember the day I decided I'm going to tell everyone I can. I'm going to make this public. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to talk about it and speak about it because people need to know. Because I don't know how many people they take, but it's it's a lot. And well, the woman in the conversation that that I'll get I'll get to that. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's good that you did because it's quite disturbing, Terry, when you said that there are other people on that ship. That quite shocked me because there are other people they've snatched up there, powerless like yourself. So I think it's an admirable thing you did to write this beautiful yes. book. We, uh, I, I made the determination that I was going to. I reached the decision to write the book in 2014, and my wife flew to Michigan and retrieved the notebooks. I wasn't sure if we still had them, but she found them. And she brought them back. So in actually 2016, I made the decision to, to, to take what I had formulated just as an outline and a collection of uh, sketches and put them together. And I started this book in earnest. And I went to a UFO conference. I had never been to a UFO uh, event of any kind. Uh, sure. And I might mention since 1977, when I had this event, uh, the topic of UFOs was not discussed in my household. I mean, I never read anything to do. I never read UFO books. Uh, I never discussed the topic because my wife and I learned uh, that every time we did, these nightmares would come roaring back yeah. uh, just by the mere discussion. So we kept, we kept silent. So I began writing the book in earnest, and it was October late October 2017, just not that long ago, mm -hmm. and I woke up, and this is this is such an incredible story, and I ask your listeners to, to please bear with me because it is an incredible story. It's and, fascinating. And I woke up uh, sitting bolt upright in my living room, open my eyes, and I'm wide awake. And I'm sitting in the chair where I normally seat, where I'm normally seated, but I'm sitting bolt upright. And seated directly across from me is what I first took to be a small Asian woman. Now I can see the alarm panel to my left is set, mm -hmm. and I had that ionized air smell again that I recognized that I smelled when I was a kid. It's that after a thunderstorm. And I thought about screaming for my wife. And I thought, no, they've taken care of that. And I'm looking, I look at this woman and she's dressed all in black and she has long black, long black sleeves uh, and a kind of a, a wig that's on a skew, kind of a, almost a comical wig. <laughs> and a very large over, oversized pair of sunglasses. Now, if this woman were to walk the streets of downtown Dallas, I, I doubt if she'd draw a second look. <laughs> but she's in front of me, and I'm looking at her. They communicate telepathically, mm -hmm. which yes. is, is it's most incredible thing in that I don't know anyone who is disciplined enough to communicate telepathically because it requires an, intel an incredible amount of self-discipline mm -hmm. to control your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked at this woman, and I had that feeling of calm wash over me. Mm -hmm. So I had no panic. I had no fear. I noted she was in a, a non-threatening posture. And the, again, you can't control your thoughts. The thought crossed in my mind that... There was a cartoon show called The Flintstones. Yeah. In the 60s. I watched it as a child. And there was a character, Betty Rubble. And from a silhouette, she looked like Betty Rubble with this mm -hmm. wig. Mm -hmm. And the thought crossed my mind, my God, that wig looks ridiculous. <laughs> and immediately, before I had finished my, my thought, uh... I could hear her clear as a bell in my head say, you don't like my wig. It's exactly the same as before. And of course, I thought same as before when? Hmm. And she said the last time we were together. And then I had the thought, I wish she could take I wish I could see more of her face. And before I could even complete the thought, she reaches up and pulls on her sunglasses. 
and there is an instant recognition. I know this woman. Hmm. There, there, there's an instant familiarity there. And instead of fear, I kind of felt it was almost like it's good to see you again. Yeah. And I asked her, I said, I'm not used to my thoughts being open and being read by anybody. I'm used to my thoughts being private. Yeah. And again, telepathy, speaking via telepathy. And she responds and says, you know, don't. just try, Terry. You can keep some of your thoughts private. Uh, you already know how to comp- compartmentalize things in your mind. You can just keep your private thoughts to yourself. No. I think I think that was said just to placate me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I asked her, "Are you? Am I going to be taken tonight?" I wasn't fearful mm. because I had that calm wash over me. But it was a legitimate thought: Am I going to be taken tonight? And she said, "No, you're not going to be taken. Taken. Uh, no more examinations ever. I promise you." Mm. And I drew some comfort from that. I hope it's true. I don't know if it's true. I've not been taken since or had any visitation since. Mm-hmm. And I asked her, I said, why are, why are you here? And she said, I'm here because you are speaking openly about, about your experiences, about 1977, and you're speaking openly about um, the implants. And I, and I thought, my fire, I fired back the thought, what does this have to do with the implants? What do these things, what purpose do these things in my legs serve? Yeah, sure. And her answer was, they serve many purposes. Mm. All, she, all she would give me. Uh, so I had, she, she dodged the question. And she said, legs, you know, the things in your legs. And I said, legs, as in plural. And then it occurred to me, my left leg had never been x-rayed yes and she told me then you have you have uh, devices she she referred to them as devices in both of your legs and um, again I, again the thought was what purpose do they serve but I, w- I could not get an answer from that yeah but she told me she stressed that if you continue to talk and if you write about your book my host will remove those implants because it's their, their their property. I was amazed that she used the word host. host. Yes. Because host can have a, a lot of different meanings. I mean, you can host a dinner party, or mm. you could be, it could refer to a, a parasitic, symbiotic type relationship. There are a couple different ways to look at the word host. And I had the thought, what? who are your host? That's what I fired back at her mentally was, who are you referring to when you say your host mm-hmm. and she said and it was almost eloquent the way she said it she said you refer to them as aliens I refer to them as my hosts because they're not alien to me and she explained to me that she was a hybrid being and oh. I asked her at the thought crossed my mind how many people have you put these things into talking about specifically about the things in my legs how many people had these implants uh, and her answer was immediate many thousands over three generations now good lord you know it makes me think uh, terry that you know the the i know that whitley streber also had encounters with uh grays much like yourself and there was a female type being that he referred referred to as ishtar as Ishtar and 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 this is something that crops up time and time again so um you were after the meeting with this apparent extraterrestrial which I I know is it was that you'd been in the presence of Terry um you continue to write your book you defied what the uh, being had said I did I did and she she gave me a stern warning and she said that her host would reclaim their their uh, items from my legs she also told me that I had the question that was very important. Well, there were a lot of things that were important that I did not get a chance to ask that I regret. Um, Always happens. But I wanted, wanted to ask, why am I different? Why am I different? You know, why lots of people different? write books about UFOs. Lots of people have experiences, I'm sure. What makes my experiences any different? And she played out a vignette 
uh, and I had no, no doubt in my mind that she sent this thought to me. This wasn't my thought. This wasn't a confabulation. This wasn't uh, a dream. But I saw this almost outside my body as like almost like a detached observer. What she showed me was uh, I made some drawings of the what I refer to as the big ship. And I spoke of the big ship when I was uh, being interrogated by the OSI. And that's a very touchy subject. Those Anything to do with the moon um, was, uh, was, she said, you know, your government will not be happy with you. And in the book, I say it because it's true. She said the words, your government will kill you. Now, those, those, those are haunting words. But, you know, I took that to be the, the biggest protection I have is to be visible and, you know, to be as, as open and as, and as loud as I can and tell as many people as I can. Uh, you're not doing a bad job, Terry, at all, because, you know, through all that you've gone through and, and, and really, definitely, it's the most bizarre case I've ever read. And it is the most chilling and haunting. And, uh, you know, but you did it. You've got your book yes. out there. I was just saying Terry is making a lot of noise uh, to try and prevent them from killing him. That's what you're that's what you're suggesting, isn't it? So that he's a he becomes a, a well known figure and it would be frowned upon and looked upon as suspicious if anyone tried to uh, do him in. Yes. Now, I've had uh, an odd text message or two uh, that were very strange. I took them to my to my uh, mobile carrier and I showed them the message and I said, Where did this come from? And they were able to trace it to, it's not a uh, land-based uh, mobile, it's a, what he referred to as a satellite phone, hmm. that uh, they ping uh, off of a satellite instead of a tower. Right. So there was no way to tell where that message originated, but the message was, or be careful when you cross the street. Oh my God, that's and, very, very bizarre. Very. And that's very bizarre, and you know... Hmm. And, I've adjusted my life accordingly. I won't. I won't take my grandchildren across the street anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I make uh, sure I look both ways. I don't know if that was a warning or a threat. I don't know. I don't know what that was. It would. It seems to me that the warning she gave you, Terry, and indeed the the clandestine effort of the aliens, they want it kept covert. They want it kept secret, and that is quite alarming. It's quite worrying, isn't it? Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. And, you know, they did. I, we're talking about the aliens. The aliens did come back. I, I should finish the story. The aliens did yeah, come sure. back and retrieve their property. Yes. It they, was they November. Took back. Yes. Three weeks later, it was November 17th. I woke up and I felt like someone had hit me with a bat or a hammer at the top of my thigh. Uh, Mm -hmm. both of my legs and I could hardly walk and my wife said you know you've got this weird wound at the time I had some discoloration the bruising really didn't come up until about 36 hours afterward but I had a weird wound in the center of my upper thigh about the size of a large like a mosquito bite but it was odd in that if you looked at it with a through a magnifying glass the wound wasn't round it was square like box like Mm mm-hmm and then the, the, the bruising, as I said, came out 36 hours later. And my wife said, uh, well, first of all, we have to get pictures of this. And secondly, she says, you, you've got to get an x-ray. You know, I, I think they came and took these things out of your leg. And I said, yeah, you, you think? I think so, too. The problem is, you know, I, I don't have connections in the medical community like I did when I was assistant AG in the state of Vermont. I'm living in Texas sure. now. I don't have the connections that I used to have. So... Going out to get an X-ray turned out to be kind of a challenge, but I found a uh, a radio, pardon me, a chiropractor, and I had a copy of my my X-rays with with the objects in, in my hand, and uh, I waited. I didn't have an appointment. I waited 45 minutes to talk to this chiropractor, and I went into his office and I said, speaking as fast as I could, uh, I need your help, sir. And that doctor, I have these alien implants in my legs. If you'll take a look here, I'll just show you. And he's, <laughs> and he, by my elbow, he's politely leaned, walking me toward the door. And I said, uh, Doctor, I understand you're busy. I can understand the demands of your schedule. If you take just a moment, if you look right here. And he did. And he stopped. And he said, let me see that. 
and he says, let's go into my office for a minute. And, and I went into his office he sh and shut the door. And he said, tell me about this. And there are urgent knocks at his door. His phone is buzzing. And he wants to hear every word. And I told him every word. Mm -hmm. And I gave him one of the first copies of my book in, in, in gratitude. Uh, he was very insistent that I not name him, and of course I didn't. Yeah. Uh, but he wrote a he wrote a prescription uh, for an X-ray right away. Uh, but there was a level of empathy there that I think the good doctor is probably uh, can relate to the son on some level more than the average person. Yeah. Yes. I can. I mean, I can see this. The on the photographs in your book, they're quite. It's quite painful looking. I mean, good Lord, that's the bruising. And it's very peculiar. The bruising is like flower petals within a circle. It's very weird. Well, and my wife made the observation. It, it blew. It. I didn't make the connection right away. But if you look at the flower petal arrangement of yeah. the objects below my knee, it's the same arrangement. So, so these these implants, Terry, I mean, we hear about implants. I, I, I've I've. I've heard so much about them, and um, I've done a little bit of uh, uh, investigation for my own personal reasons. But yours are very different. Your your implants seem to be highly structured. So, you know, I'm I'm really fascinated because there's obviously something about you as a soul, as an individual, that the entities, the ETs, the uh, visitors find very interesting now i wonder you know if there's going to be any form of uh, re, um you know reprieve from this because you've gone against the visitor's words and rightfully you're right in doing what you did because anyone else would feel complete outrage and you know being abducted and having your mind screwed up and then having the government on your case you know it's any wonder you didn't tip go over the edge like a lot of other people would but you you remain grounded and you wrote this book so i know that afterwards you started to lose a lot of weight have you combated that now is that is your weight returning now my, my weight has not returned but it has stabilized uh -huh. in that uh, I, I i cannot get above the threshold of 160 and i really need to be at 175 and i yeah. Yeah. I take uh, drinks to supplement my nutrition and, uh, you know, I have to walk. I walk a mile a day for cardiovascular benefit. I mean, that burns a few calories. Um, do you, um, do you, Terry, um, when, the, uh, when the implants had been removed from you, have you felt any differently whatsoever to, to when you had them in before? Or is there completely no, no co connection with the way that you feel? I mean, do you feel any differently? Well, well, two things I should mention. Yeah, that. Um, well, first of all, the the X-ray that the chiropractor ordered for me, um, I dropped them off. I looked at them and I I saw that the implant was gone, and I didn't see anything else. And I dropped the X-ray off for the chiropractor as he asked, mm -hmm. uh, and he called me later that that evening and said, "Well, they left something behind. Did you see it?" Yeah. <laughs> and I said, no, doctor, I don't know what you're talking about. And he showed me where to look on the x-ray. And there are two tiny wires left deep mm. inside my thigh muscle. And they're there. They're visible on x-ray. And they're still there. Also, the objects below my knee are still there. <laughs> I reckon, as I said to Terry Phillip, I reckon they're tracking systems. They, they know exactly where you are. And they can they can sniff you out like a bloodhound. They'll be able to find you at their convenience. It just troubles me. And when you when you relay the incident of uh, the reoccurring nightmares of when you actually saw yourself aboard the the mothership, the main ship, was the people there screaming. And the fact that it is covert, what they want to do, these beings want to keep it covert. That is very disturbing. <laughs> Quite dark, actually, Terry. So. And I thought it was really, really lovely of you, your compassion for the other people, wondering if they got out alive or not, because it seems to me that they're, if they can snatch anyone at night, they can perform as they do medical operations on them or God knows what, you know? Yes. And I, I, I maybe Stockholm syndrome. I mean, I felt so fortunate to be a survivor mm -hmm. that I felt almost survivor guilt 
Yes. Did you when you when you when it, forgive me for asking when you were in that situation when you were there and you saw the people did you feel the aliens around you at the time or were you just primarily focused on the people and the the ship? I know there was a lot to take in. Did you notice any of the extraterrestrials around you at all or not? Yes. At that point, I, I had an incredible experience that that I that I should tell you about, and that is please do standing as a matter of fact this happened at the time that i'm hearing toby scream so loudly yeah Um, and please don't forget i I do want to mention toby before we end and and and, uh of course course. but as as i'm hearing toby scream i'm kind of looking around uh i mean i don't feel like i have the uh freedom to move around very much but i'm looking around with my eyes uh, I can see the the crowd of people off to my right, uh, and they too look uh, kind of glazed eyes. Yes, yes. Some were nude and had their clothes in their uh, folded up and in their hands. Yeah. And there was a there were the grays all around who seemed to be doing the work, mm-hmm. and I remember the term worker bees for some reason stuck with me, mm-hmm. but there was a taller being there that seemed to be in control of things. And I recall, he said, as Toby was screaming, I turned my head to look at this being, and at the moment that I turned my head, he turned his head, and we locked eyes. And in that instant, uh, I, I don't know how to describe it other than I felt absolutely naked. I felt like he knew me. In an instant, I felt like he knew my thoughts, my plans. He knew my wife. He knew knew everything about me in in, in an instant. Good God. Behind those, you know, when I look in my dog's eyes, I can sense trust. Yeah. Love behind those eyes. Uh, And, you know, but my dog is subservient. There's a master relationship i mean i love my dog but i mean there's that mess i felt like i was the dog here god because Mm. when i looked at this thing we locked eyes there was nothing but intellect pure just raw intellect behind those eyes Mm. and not an ounce of compassion or mercy or empathy uh ethics nothing but just raw intellect that I that, that, that's horrific. That's I know it's hard, but thank you for sharing that with us. That's very fascinating. And uh, Toby, we need to know about. Well, we do know, what, but, but I think the listeners need to know what happened to Toby Terry. Yes. As I as I mentioned, there was something changed in our relationship. Yeah. At Devil's Den, uh, and I, I can't explain it, but I, I wanted nothing to do with Toby, mm-hmm. which was. I mean, it made no sense whatsoever. This was my best friend. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was shipped out and went to, in the book I say he went to Japan. He was shipped out. And um, we learned that his ex wife, he was dismissed from the military because of drinking. Yes. Uh, and this is a guy that I knew as a non-drinker or only a moderate drinker. I mean, he, he would nurse a 12 ounce can of beer, you know, for an evening while playing cards. He just wasn't a drinker. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, um, his wife had no idea where he was, except she thought that he was on the streets of a major city. And, uh, I did have information from her to contact his father. And I called him and I said, I'm, in, right, I called him and said, I'm trying to find your son. And yeah. he told me that his son, uh, he wanted to know who I was. And when I told him, he knew immediately who I was. Yeah. And he said, you know, you were the man with the, you were the guy that went with him on the camping trip. I know who you were. And he said, uh, Toby said they hurt you. Did they hurt you too? And I said, yes, yeah, sir, they did. But I think they hurt your son much worse than they hurt me. Mm-hmm. Uh and he said that his son was living on the street. Now, some years later, uh, I, I felt the need, the real need to connect with Toby again. Mm-hmm. With my position, I knew some people in law enforcement. Uh, and I had a friend with the uh, FBI who yes. I said, I, I, I want to find this guy. Mm-hmm. And he had passed. 
in uh, early 80s, 82. And uh, so it was um, a difficult time for you. And you know what? We're very you know, sorry you, to hear that. You, you know what, Terry? I've got to tell you one thing. You guys were involved in something that went beyond any form of rational, humane, you know, understanding because you were witness to something that was unearthly you were obviously at the right place at the right time and obviously in the wrong place at the wrong time for other reasons and i think that with regards to your destiny and your unfolding the nature of your soul unfolding with this complete understanding now that that is enriched not only yourself but all the other people i think it's an amazing experience and i'm and i have to tell you Terry that we're, we're, we're running short of time now but I, I have to tell you that I'm so moved by your story uh, and we want to thank you for coming on our show we really do I, yes. I've sat here Ronnie I've sat here spellbound because yes, I don't know yeah. this, this gentleman Terry Lovelace is absolutely a wonderful author I just remind our readers that he is a best selling author of an incredible book and I do urge you to go out and buy it immediately because it is so kindly written it's just so easy to get into and it's fascinating and it's also very haunting it's called Incident at Devil's Den a true story by Terry Lovelace former assistant attorney general and please do as I said the book is a bestseller, and I can understand why and and also I've got to add sorry Terry I've got to put my piece in here as well because I when I read the book and I've read it twice as I've said I'm going to get it on audio because I know you said it's coming on audio on Amazon yes, I'm looking forward to that it, it, it is hopefully within the next uh, well within the next few days as a matter of fact it may be out by the time this airs Okay, so okay. Um, I, I just ask our listeners, please, you know, you need to read Terry Lovelace's book, um, Incident at Devil's Den. It is the most remarkable, haunting, and so honest account of one man's struggle with extraterrestrial entities. And not only that, but also the OSI. And, you know, uh, so go out and buy the book. And, and how can people get hold of you terry as well how can they get hold of you i welcome anybody to contact me there are two ways uh, i have a facebook page uh, uh -huh. incident at devil's den and i'll be honest with you philip and uh ronnie i social media has never been my favorite thing but, <laughs> I really, an effort, really am making an effort uh i have a uh, an email address a personal email address and if if you have a question, uh, if you just like a comment, or, or or if you just want to reach out to somebody because maybe this has happened to you, uh, I can be reached at Lovelace dot Land Pope, L A N D P O P E, Lovelace dot Land Pope at Gmail dot com, and I will answer uh, every single email that I get and I get a dozen every morning and that's how I start my day is with coffee and answering corresponding with people who uh, who say you're going to think I'm crazy or now you're going to find this hard to believe or <laughs> some kind of disclaimer to be honest with you I don't think any of them are anymore I think there's a doubt uh, being cast over the people who are dubious because there's so much more being seen and so many unearthly things happening um, people love mysteries especially when they're true and your book is haunting and absolutely beautiful I commend you for writing it Terry it's a beautiful piece of work and I'm so proud to have um, gentlemen in this world like you who are brave enough to face what happened and to come forward and expose it to the public. I admire you humbly. Well, thank you very much. I thank you very kindly. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to connect with a, with a new audience. Uh, yes. yes. I, I love Great Britain. My, my family, my uh, ancestors are from Great Britain. And uh, I've yeah. always had fondness uh, Brilliant. Well, uh, Terry, I want another book. I don't care what you say. I want another book. I, I need another book. So uh, anyway, I'm, I, thank you so much, Terry, for coming on board. Um, you've, listened to, you've been listening to Twin Souls uh, in association with the Paranormal UK uh, radio network. And um, 
I, I'm so glad. Thank you, Terry, for coming on board. Thank you, Ronnie, Thank you. for for your support as well. Oh, and, uh, I've been God. absolutely. I've been delighted waiting all yeah. week to speak to Terry. I mean, it's only unfortunate I, I couldn't speak to him last week because I wasn't here. But it's a pleasure, <laughs> Terry. Thank you very much, Lovely. Terry. So you go out and you buy the book, um, you know, Instant at Devil's Den, Terry Lovelace. Get it as paperback, ebook, or audio book. Just go and buy it, read it. You'll be amazed. And God bless to all our listener, listeners. Stay safe and um, speak soon. Take care. Uh-